Uh, thank you all for coming. So what I would like to talk about today is um, rather introductory. So um, I want to talk about reactive web applications on the JVM. So I will also talk about Scala, Akka, and Play, but that's going to be the, uh, the second part of this talk. So um, I read somewhere that a good presentation should have an agenda. So here is the uh, agenda for today. First, I'm going to talk about the why, and second, I'm going to talk about the how. A few words about myself. I'm a freelance software consultant. I live in Vienna in Austria. Here you can see me scuba diving in the Danube. No. That would be great, but no, we don't have turtles there. Um, I'm a co-organizer also of the Vienna Scala user group, and uh, for most of my career I've been doing web stuff. So web applications from the back-end servers to the front-end, um, and uh, for the five past years I've been working mostly with Scala, uh, Akka and Play, and so shameless plug here is I'm uh, writing a book on reactive web applications. It's um, supposed I try to make it a pragmatic book. So if you don't know much about reactive things, it's trying to give you all of the tools that you need in order to write these kind of applications. So the why, first part, it's actually the whys. It's not not just one reason here. So the first reason is it's 2015. So what did we expect to happen in 2015? Anyone knows this? <laughs> <laughs> Flying cars. Um, did, did, you, did you know that you know, Return to the Future is the future is already in our past? It was the 16th of February or something. So, um, and we haven't gotten the flying cars. I mean, I'm personally rather disappointed. Um, what we got instead are as many core CPUs. So this one here has 72 cores. Um, it's not any more multi-core even, it's many cores. It's like many, many cores. And what's interesting in the space is that there are many small players, there are many different hardware players that, that are building these things. So for example, the Adaptiva Parallela is a board you can buy for $99. You get a board with 12 cores on it. Um, so what hardware people told us a few years back when they said, sorry guys, we can't cram more chips. We have to go, we, we can't give you more gigahertz. We have to go and, and have more cores. That's actually really happening. Um, so this is a bit of a, um, you know, when we predict what's going to happen with our hardware resources, you may remember or know that Bill Gates said that 640 kilobytes of memory, that's, yeah, that's enough, right? Um, I mean, he was a little off. What's... The irony is um, Linus Torvalds, of all people, <laughs> a few weeks, uh, December, I think, last year, he said that uh, end users are fine with roughly on the order of four cores. Um, I don't know. I think we'll find a way to sort of use these four cores and, and complain and, and end up with 32 and 128 cores and, who you knows, thousands of cores in a matter of a few years. End users, yeah, end users. Um, so that's coming. Um, many cores are there. Also what's there is uh, we don't write applications anymore. Seldomly have applications that only run on one machine. So we distribute. Everything is in the cloud. If you look at what uh, many, many how many applications are built is that they will rely on services. Uh, they will outsource their concerns to specialized services such as, uh, you know, S3 for storage, images, there is Cloudinary, uh, different services for emails, etc., etc. You don't build all of these things on your own. What you do is you use something that someone else did and spends their time on specializing. So you connect. And the way we do this is by using the cloud. So I will see. It went up. It went up. So there was supposed to be a movie here, but never mind. Um, yeah, so nobody understands the cloud. It's, uh, and um, so what's the cloud? I mean, this is not the cloud. Definitely not. This is an IBM Z13 mainframe with 10 terabytes of memory and 141 cores at 5 gigahertz, which is great if you can afford it. But uh, few people afford it. Who affords it? It's mostly people that have a legacy system, banks, insurance companies, and who cannot uh, or are very afraid of 
porting their legacy system to anything new. So they get these things, but that's not how we build applications. How we build applications now is more like this. It's like we have the servers and racks and we connect them with, you know, cables. That's what, and then we scale out when we have more load and we scale back in, uh, you know, and we have many nodes. So if one fails, it doesn't matter because we, we fail over, right? That's uh, how we would like to think that it is. But in fact, it's more like this. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a big mess. It's, uh, that's the cloud. It's a network. So um, uh, I have a, a background in telecommunications. I can tell you that behind the scenes, people are busy trying to fix things all day long. Uh, and it somehow works. It's amazing. Um, and networks are hard. They fail all the time. There is this blog series called the Jepson series on afir.com. If you have a chance, check it out. It's, uh, it kind of describes what happens to many different technologies when uh, the network fails and how they just don't work anymore. So um, you may have heard of the eight fallacies of distributed computing, you know, what we think, how it works, that the network is reliable, there is no latency, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things that you slowly discover when you build an online system, uh, that's just not true. And then we have the CAP theorem, which stands for which says that you cannot both have consistency and availability on a network partition that mostly or that also mostly affects database systems because you have to make a choice. Do I let my people do I let my users write and then at the end when the network comes back together I have a merge problem? Or do I just say, sorry, you can't use the system, but then my users aren't really happy? Um, this is really a hard problem to solve. Many very smart people spend a lot of time on this. We have Paxos, which is a series of, or a family of protocols for getting to a consensus uh, when we have a network that may be a bit um, unreliable. We have um, CQRS, stands for Command and Query Responsibility Segregation, which uh, is a way to actually scale out and, and, and deal, or it makes it possible to actually scale out and deal with massive writes and reads. And, um, and then we have cool data structures, the um, CRDTs that, that uh, sort of make it possible to merge back after you've had a, uh, a partition. So these things are there, they, they, and we start to use and to see them actually in, in technology that's available online. Uh, really complicated things, but so there is hope. However, uh, how, who, who is watching Game of Thrones here? You know? Yes, yes. So uh, you may have, uh, you know, winter is coming. Um, so that's, uh, that's winter here. That's this, this part here is winter. Uh, that's, uh, according to Gardner, we will end up with 26 billion connected devices in uh, 2020. That's in five years. And someone <laughs> will have to deal with these things. Someone being on the server side. If you, uh, Siemens just launched a dishwasher that uh, you can access with your phone. I don't know why you would need it, but it's there, it exists. We will have fridge that will talk to your microwave or, you know, tell you when to buy what. Um, and all of this data, this is going to generate a lot of traffic, of course, but also a very large amount of data. So there is a, a Ninja Line is doing a talk about the data in, in the other room, so... Uh, about Spark, which is a, a technology for dealing with vast amounts of data. Uh, it's, um, it, you know, this is something that I, I think is going to be really big and interesting. Um, on a side note here, this is my router at home. And uh, this is an actually host name. It's a question mark. And then there is another device here. I have no idea what it is. So these things, they come online all the time. I, when I go offline, they come back. I don't know where they are in my flat. So my prediction, you can quote me on this, is that by 2020, everyone will have a bunch of lost things in their flat that are online and nobody will know what they are. <laughs> uh, that's one of the side effects of the Internet of Things, I think. It's frustrating to have things in your network and you don't know where they are, believe me. So the four, fourth why now is, um, is that actually if we, if we take all of this in, into consideration, we have a problem. And the problem is that um, we have tools, programming tools and techniques that aren't really fit for, uh, for working in this setting with many cores and the, the distributed setting. That's from uh, Apollo 13. 
and actually they had to fix this. They had to fix this in order to get to breathe again. Uh, so uh, what happened is we have been brainwashed to use uh, imperative programming with mutable state, global mutable state, and to use locks. So the problem with mutable state, here is an example. My drawing skills, as you can see, are, yeah, so-so. So we have a car, it starts at position zero, and then we mutate its position, we, we have it move to 10. That's easy, right? That's okay. Now things are getting a little more complicated because we have two threads that run concurrently. We have a first thread that is moving our car and our second thread is uh, reading its position. And then the question is, what does the second car, the second thread see? Does it see it at zero or at 10? Yes, <laughs> it depends. It's great. We love it when we program and we don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, that's uh, indeterminism, one of my favorite things to work with. Usually that means there is a bug and some user will come and complain. Um, so what do we do? How do we solve this? How do we fix this? Synchronize. Synchronize. Yes, we lock. Uh, we use locks. That's great. There is just one problem is that... Uh, only Brian Guts gets them right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we've been doing in Java. And, uh, oh, it has worked so well. Uh, I, every time I have to work with more than one thread, I'm, uh, I have this feeling that I'm, I'm going to get a live log or a dead log or something. Um, they're hard to reason about, and they're not really a solution. They're a workaround. Because what happens is uh, that there is a problem with the conceptual model in which we approach all of this. Um, also, when you use locks, you're going to get a high performance cost, especially if you're really into performance and you really have a, you're really concerned about speed. And all of this synchronization, all of this communication between threads to get things right is costing a lot of resources and time. So what do we have in object-oriented uh, languages as they're implemented in Java is that we have no notion of time, right? The language in the language specification, nowhere does it say that there is time and nowhere do we, when we program, nowhere do we specify that we, we are um, actually uh, doing something in a certain order or we don't talk about time. But there is an illusion of time because, you know, the car before who have one line, we kind of expect the second line to run after the first line, which in many cases is true. But when you, run, uh, when you work concurrently, then that's not, uh, that's not happening anymore so much. It, things can just change a bit in a random order. So we have this broken conceptual or, uh, model, and it only makes sense. Yes, it does work sometimes if you're local. If you make changes locally and you have a safe space and you mutate things in this safe space and nobody else can look at it, and that's great. But uh, only at some point you will need to connect to the outside world and talk with other people. Uh, and uh, when, when you have this situation, then uh, you run into a problem. So this is even getting harder if, if you sort of uh, work with different machines, then uh, this problem is even getting increasingly more complex. So, to recap here, yes, many core CPUs are here. They're not going to go away. I'm pretty sure in two, three years, we'll all run with 32 cores on our phones and what's or not, you know. I don't think this is going to go away. We may wish it away, but it's there to stay. Um, the second thing, everything is distributed. Uh, we do cloud, I mean, that's just how things work these days. Uh, so we have the Internet of Things that's going to come and smash our servers into small pieces if we don't get ready for it. And then our traditional or the, the, the things that have been taken for granted, the techniques that have been taken for granted, they, uh, they don't, just don't work in the setting. So what do we do then? That's the second part now, the how. And again, it's not the how, it's the hows. It's uh, many different things that we can do in order to uh, get things uh, to work in this. So in theory, um, we can use, well, first of all, functional programming, which kind of fits to the theme of the conference. Yes. Um, we have uh, something called the actor model, which I will briefly talk about. 
We have an evented server model as opposed to a threaded server model for, doing, uh, for taking care of incoming requests in a web application and a stateless architecture. We also have two great things, uh, event sourcing and uh, reactive streams. I won't have time to talk about them, but um, these are two very interesting uh, approaches. And so what I want to do here now in this part is sort of link these concepts and use uh, technology to, uh, as an example of how uh, they can be achieved. So for functional programming, I will uh, go and talk a bit about Scala. The actor model is going to be with ACA. The server, evented server and stateless architecture is with the play framework. And then the other two things, event sourcing, uh, there is a sub-project of ACA, ACA Persistence. I'm writing a uh, system with it right now. It's really nice. Um, and ACA Streams is a, an implementation of directive streams. Yeah. So let's get started with um, functional programming. So Scala... How many of you know Scala, know about th that it exists? Yes. Anyway, for a short recap here, we uh, have Martin Oderski that from the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, he invented it. It was first released in 2003. And there is a company called TypeSafe that provides um, professional services around Scala, uh, um, the Play Framework, and ACA, and more things. <coughs> So the design goals of uh, Scala, the first one was to be fully interoperable with Java, which I believe was, is uh, still a killer feature, because uh, that means that you can run Scala code from Java, you can run Java code from Scala, so you can easily integrate Scala in an existing project. Uh, you don't have to rewrite everything. It cuts down boilerplate, it has a very smart uh, type inference system and that, that makes for much nicer and neater code. Um, it's both a purely object-oriented programming language and a functional programming language. So you can start writing your object-oriented classes and so on, and then slowly transition over to functional, which also is very nice. One thing it actually really, I mean, this um, null pointer exception, everyone knows these? Yes, so null pointer exceptions is something that in the past five years, since I started to only work with uh, Scala, I've not seen so often, and when I saw it, it was some Java library that, that threw up a null pointer exception. Because by using the option type, uh, you actually, if you're consistent about using it, you can really get rid of this problem. And then last but not least, it's been designed around the idea of many core programming. Yay. So a few core concepts I want to quickly go through here. Uh, in terms of functional programming, we have immutability as opposed to mutable uh, state, uh, mutable state. We have um, functions and higher order functions, and we have the idea of um, composing functions in order, in order to transform data. Immutability. This is a car, which has a brand. I hope you can, can you read this? There's a brand and a position. So we start with a DeLorean at position zero, and then we don't change this car anymore. It's not going to change. Once we have defined the car, we cannot change it. If we try to change it, the Scala compiler will tell, it, tell us it's not possible. What we do instead is we copy the first car here, and then we copy it later on, and then it moves. So we take snapshots of reality. We have one value. We can share it, and the person that's, or the component or whatever is going to work with it can be sure that it's not going to change under the hood. So we remove this indeterminism. The card position zero is always going to be a card position zero. So what we do is, in fact, we copy, we, we take snapshots, and that's how we, how we deal with changes there. Um, yes. And then we have higher order functions. So this is, uh, this is a higher order function here. Um, we have a list of users, and we partition the users according to a criteria. We look at their age and we say that users that are uh, older than 18 or they, they're going into second place here and the ones that are, uh, yeah, anyway. So we can rewrite it like this. It's called a function literal in Scala. Um, and it's a function that takes a, uh, an age and that returns a boolean. And then what we do is we take that function and we feed it as a parameter to the second, to this function here. So that's the definition of a higher order function. Or one of the definitions is that it's a, it's a function that takes a, 
uh, another function as an argument. And this is, uh, it's, this appears simple, but it's actually very powerful because what do we do with this is that instead of moving data around, we move behavior around. And that's quite a, mind sh a different way of thinking. Um, so what we do is we transform data using this higher order function. We don't mutate it, we transform it. So we start with our users. Here we, we just filter the ones that are older than 18. We fetch the addresses and then we sort all of this by city and we end up with a little list of addresses that are sorted by city. But our initial list has not moved. We haven't touched or changed anything. What we did is simply to, um, to transform it and, and sort of extract what we need from it. So what we, it's like, playing Lego, you know, Lego blocks. You build small pieces, small pieces, and then you compose these pieces together to do something increasingly more complex. So this is um, an example, and I'm, I'm, I don't want you to look too much at the code. I'm going to quickly go over these slides. You may notice that there is a similarity between these slides here. We always do more or less the same thing, but we have different types in here. Uh, that's the skeleton that we use. It's a four comprehension. And um, what we have is really is these types that we can manipulate in the same way. Option, which is a type in Scala that says there is something here or, or there is nothing. Future, which means there is eventually maybe going to be something in the future. And try, which is a way to sort of catch exceptions on the fly. And uh, what, what we do with this, or what, what this is good for, it's um, this functional composition is these data structures, <laughs> they uh, implement monadic operations. It's like this, wah, uh, yeah. Uh, but it's not that complicated. It's just a set of data structures that follows uh, laws. It you know, implements um, a few laws. And once you get it, the great thing is that once you get it, once you understand that, oh, this is there, and you know, this is a model, then you can work with all of them the same way. You get all of these tools uh, for free once you understand how one of these works. And that makes for a uh, nice code, easier, more easy to read once you understand it. It's not that scary, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's okay. Um, Okay, that was my uh, short take on functional programming. Now I want to quickly talk about actors. So, um, ACCA, so the short history uh, here is that we have uh, the actor model um, in 73 um, by Carl Hewitt and Co. Uh, that sort of describe this actor model wherein you have actors that uh, communicate by using messages. And it's actually based on physics and quantum physics. I didn't know that until recently when I read a bit more about it. Is that What he said is that he looked at physics sort of describing how the world around him works and sort of tried to put that in a conceptual model. And then in 86, um, there was the first release of Erlang. Um, and... Um, you know, by Joe Armstrong at uh, Ericsson, and then they kind of didn't use it for many years, and then they rediscovered it and uh, started using it. And then they have this switch that had an availability of nine nines. So that's 31.5569 milliseconds of downtime per year. That's, just, that's amazingly good uh, in terms of it's not going, it's really robust. It allows for a really resilient, robust system. Um, in 2010, that was the first release of Akka. Uh, it comes from Sweden. Um, and it's inspired by the actor model. And in my opinion, it's uh, object-oriented programming done right. Because you do have your objects, and you do have mutable state, but it's all in a safe place inside of the actor. Nobody else can look at it unless the actor wants you to. And uh, I'll, I will explain just how this works. Akka also happens to be a mountain in Sweden, and you may notice that there is sort of a similarity between the logo and uh, the mountain. I don't know. They, I was told that that's the case, but yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I should mention that. 
All right, so actors, these are lightweight objects, tiny, tiny lightweight objects. You can have millions of them running on one JVM. And what they do is they send and, uh, and receive messages. They send messages to each other, and they receive them in a mailbox. Actors can have children, uh, and then you have a concept called supervision, wherein the parent actor is responsible for the child actor. Whatever they do wrong, they have to deal with it. So let's take an example here. We have Luke on one side, then we have Darth Sidious here and Darth Vader. They each have a mailbox. They also each have a, uh, you know, a funny looking URL here. That's called an actor reference. And Darth Vader is a, well, Darth Sidious is the supervisor of Darth Vader. And you can see here in Vader's uh, act, um, reference is that he's below uh, Sidious in the hierarchy, okay? Um, anyone ha does, did anyone not see episode five? <laughs> okay, just, you know, just don't listen and close your eyes now because I'm going to s completely spoil it for you. <laughs> yes, because that's a revelation here. <laughs> Yeah, Vader sends that message to Luke. And what does Luke do? <laughs> no! <laughs> okay, but Vader did not wait for a reply. That's important here. Vader just sent this off <laughs> and then didn't wait, right? Uh, and then eventually Luke got the message, reacted to the message and replied. Uh, yeah, he was not really happy nor thrilled about it. Uh, a bit of code here. So we have this revelation of fathership. That's our message. It's an immutable message. That's important. You should not send mutable things around. You should only send immutable messages around. And then Luke uh, is an actor uh, because he extends this actor trait here. And um, in the receive method, we see in case of revelation of fathership, we kind of uh, are very sad. Um, in order to get a look, we as as the actor system, which is the, the kind of thing that holds uh, all of the actors or takes care of them, for an instance of look. But what we actually get here is not the actor itself or an instance itself, is the actor reference. We get this thing here. It's like a phone number. Now, when you call someone, you don't grab their phone and call it. You get the phone number and... and take that and use it in order to talk to someone. So that's the idea here. You get, whoop, you get Luke here, and uh, you send him, that's this exclamation mark, send, means tell, uh, the revelation of fathership. And uh, that's a fire and forget kind of operation. Just whoosh, send it out, and I forget about it. And eventually, he's going to come back and, and react to the message, or not. Supervision. So here we have, uh, usually Darth Vader comes in and there's many stormtroopers around him, right? So we have Vader, also an actor, uh, and he is asking his actor context. The actor context, each actor has a context which kind of says what uh, helps them to interact with the outside world. For a, an actor of type stormtrooper, but with a router. A router is this thing here. Here we have a round robin router with eight uh, instances. And um, round robin just means that whenever Vader will send a message to this router, it will uh, reach them one after the other round, in a round order. So that's how it looks like usually. Um, and then a very essential part of this the supervision concept, that's because the first part is how do we define the hierarchy. The second part now is what do we do if a uh, stormtrooper has a problem because he found some Yellow Knights on the way. Well, we define a supervision strategy, it's called. And the supervision strategy is there to, you know, declare the behavior of a supervisor in case something goes wrong with one of their kids. So here we have a one-for-one -one strategy. Um, there is also an all-for-one strategy. In a one-for-one -one strategy, if one child has a problem, we will do the same thing for this. Or we will just deal with this one child. In an all-for-one strategy, should a stormtrooper have a problem, we would restart all of the stormtroopers. So what we do here is, 
in case of any kind of exception, we're just going to log it and restart. But that's just one of the things we could do. What we could do as well, we could say, okay, it doesn't matter, resume, continue. We don't care about this exception. We're going to assume that it's fine. Or we say, stop, we don't want you anymore. So depending on the kind of failure, uh, we, we build a way to um, deal with mistakes. So what happens in the, when you program with actors, instead of trying to catch uh, mistakes or errors or whatever failures inside of an actor, you just let it explode and go boom. I mean, the mantra of Akka is let it crash. So what you do is you just say, I, I'm an actor, I don't care. My supervisor will deal with my failures. It's a very, very different approach, because, an interesting one, because as programmers, we kind of sometimes think that we know everything and uh, we will think about everything. But in practice, we don't. We always forget this one case where things could go wrong. And that's something that's, uh, uh, that's, that ACA does, is that it, um, it embraces the, the, the thought that things will go wrong anyway. So let's, rather than trying to fix everything up front, as in defensive programming, let's make sure we are able to repair things when one after they have gone wrong. Okay, now the third how is, um, is uh, about evented servers and stateless architecture. In play, so play, it's a model view controller framework. It was inspired by Ruby on Rails, Django, and Symfony. And it was developed in Paris by a company called Zenic CT back then. And now they're called Zenfinity, I think. Um, it was uh, first released in 2009. It was, I think, the first Java framework that had this Railish feel. Like really this kind of Ruby on Rails feel uh, in Java. And uh, it was quite successful for that reason, I believe. And then in, in 2012, there was a second version that came out, and it was an entire rewrite, uh, and the core was rewritten in Scala. So the design principles of play is the first one, everything is compiled. Of course, your, your controller sources are compiled, um, but also your JavaScript is compiled with the Google Closure compiler. Your URLs are compiled. If you change a URL and you didn't adapt it anywhere else, it's going to blow up. You can refactor links. Um, your style sheets are compiled. Your React.js stuff is compiled. You have extensions. You can plug things in. So what happens is when you use play and you make a mistake, uh, it blows up at compile time, not at runtime. And that makes for a very productive experience because you end up having much less errors uh, at, at runtime and then later on if you didn't test correctly for the users. <clears throat> the second point, I'm going to talk about it right now. Um, the third one is if you look at a play controller, you, it's just a collection of functions from request to response. It's not exactly a function, but it has very much this feel. That's what they wanted to achieve, to make something that's very functional. A controller is just a collection of functions. And then last but not least, um, it has a share nothing approach, which means that the session in play is on the client side. It's not on the server side. It means that if you want to pan out and have uh, uh, more nodes, you won't have the problem of having to replicate the state uh, across these nodes because uh, the state is on the client. And it doesn't matter if a node disappears because then the client just fetches another node and uh, they can continue with it. All right, so what's so special about play? So this is the model, a model called the threaded uh, server model. And uh, that's what Tomcat, Jetty, and other um, web servers, application servers use. Um, and it's a bit like a train station where you have many tracks. So Tomcat, when you start Tomcat, by default, it has 200 threads allocated in the pool. So you have 200 tracks. And there is a station chief, the acceptor thread, in front that uh, whenever there is a train, it will decide, OK, you go to track five, you go to track seven, etc. It sort of uh, redirects the, the, the trains on tracks. And that's fine until all the tracks are full. And if they don't leave fast enough, then trains start queuing up. 
And if they can't uh, be processed fast enough, then you have large queues, large delays, and really unhappy travelers. And this is exactly what happens. I don't know if you've seen a Tomcat server die. It's exactly what happens. It just, you don't get anything back from it. If you have a front-end server in front of it, uh, you may get a, a timeout exception from that one, 503, I think. Uh, but um, Tomcat, the, the server itself, will be completely overwhelmed and dead. So an evented server works quite differently. It's like a waiter in a restaurant. You have many tables in a restaurant, and you have only a few waiters. You don't have one waiter per table, unless it's a really, really fancy and posh restaurant. But most of the time, you have one or two waiters in the restaurant, and they run around. They come to your table, they take your order, they go to another table, take another order, run back to the kitchen, come back, etc. But what they do are very small tasks at each table. They don't wait there for you to make up your mind while you look at the menu. They just say, okay, I will come late, back later. And, why, and, and that's how an evented server works. It will not hog on a thread while it's processing something. It's going to use asynchronous uh, calls um, all the time. And that way, it can be much more efficient. Play, by default, will start with the amount of cores. Uh, uh, play will have as many threads, web worker threads, as you have cores. So if you have a quad core server, it will have four worker threads for all of your requests. And there are benchmarks that they made, like on, uh, on a Mac like this one, you get hundreds and thousands of requests per second uh, just by using this asynchronous model and not hugging on, 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 on resources and blocking a thread. No locks. So also using this approach means that there is less memory uh, because one thread on the JVM, you have one megabyte per thread. So if you have 200 by default on Tomcat, you need 200 megabytes uh, at least. And uh, a few months back still, uh, I think you could start play with uh, 16 megabytes of, of uh, heap. That's not a lot, 16 megabytes. It's like, what? Uh, we are not used to this anymore. But that's what it enables. So we have much better CPU utilization because we don't have all of this overhead of context switching and all of this locking. And we have much that enables much higher throughput. So to recap, uh, the house, functional programming, yay. Uh, with immutability, higher order functions and composition. The actor model as a means to build complex asynchronous programs in a safe manner uh, that kind of resists to failure. Uh, then we have evented servers and uh, stateless architecture in order to build web applications and web architectures that scale out and scale back in. And last but not least, but this... This part, I won't be able to talk much about it now, but event sourcing and the reactive streams, is, which is something really interesting. I think we're, we're going to hear a lot more about this uh, in the coming years as an approach to building um, large applications and interesting applications. And um, I think that's, yeah. So the uh, small summary, two things I wanted to remember is that many cores are here, <laughs> many cores, the many core processors are here, and they're here to stay. And distributed systems are all also here to stay. So this is uh, something we just should accept. And um, we should get ready to adapt some of these, uh, use some of these new tools and techniques in order to uh, make use of these changes in how we build applications. That's it, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? So I have a question that I have two reasons uh, because of which I'm afraid <clears throat> of asking this question. Uh, first of all, you didn't mention about, I mean, you didn't talk about event sourcing. Yes. Um, and uh, the second one, this question, the answer is probably uh, a topic for, a, I mean, one hour talk or something like that. But the question is, uh, how, do you talk, uh, how do you deal with eventual consistency? Using event sourcing and CQRS. Do you have a deal? With it? Uh, how, how do you deal with eventual consistency? So, in event sourcing, what happens is you have your writes going in one side, and then you have an event stream, and the event stream um, gets piped through another system, another database, which you then query. And while these things pipe through, 
uh, you see less. Uh, you see uh, you have a disparity between these two worlds. And if you develop Twitter or Facebook, it's fine because eventual consistency is okay because nobody is going to care if your uh, tweet or your thing is going to have a little bit of delay. If you work on an accounting system, uh, you have a, or a bank or a reservation system. I'm building a reservation system right now. Then you're going to have a problem because uh, if if you're sort of seeing something, your account is out of, of sync. You're not going to be very happy. So the way uh, I'm solving this uh, pragmatically, there's an ACA cluster. You have all of these actors here in the middle, and you have an in-memory model wherein uh, you have your state uh, that's uh, that's there, uh, and. For slow queries where you don't care about the um, consistency, you use the normal query model with the replicated database. But for things that need to be live, you go and query in memory. Okay, That's but, uh, okay but you do not have any assurance that, uh, I mean, <coughs> uh, you're using a memory model, right? So yeah. this is uh, some kind of cache, right? This is your actor system, yeah. It's your okay, message. but do you have a guarantee that uh, even that occurred, um, you know, that already um, succeeded, or something like that? So well, you, you only change your state when the event has been uh, saved, and you come back and you save you you change your state according to that, and messages are queued up, so you cannot have something that comes before, sort of, at least not in. You actually have. A, Guarantee eventually consistency by shared state. Mm. <laughs> um, it's not so much shared state because you have it in one actor in one place, so it's not so much shared. You have it. In that one else to get the state, so it's shared state. I, I mean, the actors don't get, they don't have access directly, but they have to talk to the same. They have to, yeah. yeah. You have a bottleneck there, but uh, that's that's true. But uh, in practice, this doesn't have. I mean. The, in, in practice, if you design your system well, then you're okay. And in the case of the system I'm writing right now, I know there's going to be a lot more reads than there's going to be writes. So I kind of can use this approach. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, one question about the Luke uh, sending the message. And can, can you go to the slide where you were sending the message to Luke? Uh, this one. The, the code, the code. Oh, the code, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you do, Luke, uh, and then uh, send the revelation. Uh, is, that, is that like a real code, or do you, do you, do you not need uh, the sender to say it's not coming from Vader? Uh, in, in the current version of ACA, so that's a good question. In the current version of ACA, you can do this, and the sender is going to be there implicitly. ACA is going to take care of it, and whenever you receive, like you have a receive method here, I could go in here in the receive method and say sender, and sender would be the sender of the message. There are, there's a new uh, API that's called typed actors that's coming out now, and in that one you actually need to have the sender part of the message. Uh, but you, with that code, what, what would be the sender? This in this one. Uh, that's uh, here, out of here, uh, that would be something, if we were running this, in the, in the world like this, there would be some anonymous uh, temporary actor that would be created. Uh, but what a proper example would have been Darth Vader sending this, because then yeah. Okay. Uh, another question: You said many good things, but is there anything that works, like I don't know, debugging or uh, doing uh, other things that are worse? Debugging gets debugging gets more complicated in 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 the system. That's for sure. Because uh, yes, um, so it's more you have to look at at logs and. Uh, it's, it's more tricky to debug. That's why reactive streams, which is a layer of abstractions on top of actors, is very interesting because it takes care of hiding all of these low-level things, and which are, can be quite confusing as if your system gets more complicated. More question? Uh, if we could stay with the slide, <clears throat> what if in uh, in the receive block, um, in uh, response of uh, you know getting a um, reveal fellowship uh, message? We want to send one, and uh, how do you test it? How do you test that? Yeah. Um, you would. There is a mock. Uh, there is a test to have, uh, actor. It's called I think test the Aka test kit, which lets you uh, sort of pretend to be an actor to mock an actor, and um, you you would probably want to test Luke in this case, right? You would want to check if Luke is actually 
yeah, reply. I want to check it, look, it, send a message. Message, message back, right. back to me. Then, yeah. then I have a test ref uh, actor, and I can see what this guy receives. Okay. So there is a test kit around it. That's quite. It's very nice to test uh, actor system. That works quite nicely. Play actors? Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of play actors, actually. Um, okay. I, I know that there were Scala actors. Scala, Scala actors. actors. They have been deprecated. They have been deprecated and then kind of replaced by, uh, by Aka. Okay. So yeah. this is deprecated. Yeah. Okay. And to the best of my knowledge, it's like gone. <laughs> OK. Uh, yes. So uh, just to see if I understand you right, so with the event sourcing, you um, kind of log the events when things have been happened already, or is it before? So uh, event sourcing means that first you have, uh, before the sourcing, you write the event. Okay. And when the event has been written to the journal and it's somewhere in a safe place, then you will change the internal state of your actor. OK, so you do it before. You do it before. And if it because there are trade offs there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we need to finish. We can still catch Marvel um, in the hall and during the day, so feel free to ask him for the idea. Yeah. If you have questions, just come to me. Thank you. Thank you.